Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Thank you all for coming to join me this evening. I appreciate each and every one of you taking the time to be with us. Kelly, thank you for that introduction. I am Dr. Melanie Kachanji. Can you all hear me okay? Kelly, would you confirm that you guys can hear me okay? I can hear you. If somebody, else, let's look in the Q&A. Um, if somebody could answer live that's a participant, that would be wonderful, but I can hear you just fine. Perfect. Um, I am Dr. Melanie Kachanji. I have been practicing urology in Tulsa for the last eight years. It's been an absolute pleasure. I am with um, Utica Park Urology. I'm hoping that by the end of this evening, in some either one of you as participants or your family members or friends, you would find some useful information to share with them that will help not only you in fully participating and living your life, but really realizing that the topics we're about to address this evening are fairly common, um, they're fairly prevalent, you're not alone, but more importantly, they're great solutions for them if you would just pick up and seek help. So when it comes to bladder and bowel uh, control issues, these aren't inevitable. Um, I think, some of these may sound familiar to you. I have patients that say, I go to the bathroom more than eight times a day. When I have to go, I have to go now. I literally have to drop the dishes at the sink and run to the bathroom. And sometimes, even though the bathroom is just a few steps away, I can't quite make it. If I have to go out with my friends, I plan my road trip or activities around the presence of bathrooms. I limit how much I drink because I'm concerned about having to need the bat needing the bathroom urgently, I have to use a pad or breathe to manage uh, the leakage, and I get up multiple times at night to use the bathroom. And patients will say, I wake up really fatigued because all night I wake up two to three hours, every two to three hours at night. And for some patients, what I tend to hear is they can't fall back asleep until so they wake up fatigued, and that interferes with the activities of daily living. Next. So when it comes to bladder and bowel issues, these are fairly common problems. One second, that advanced too far, Dr. Kachanji, one second. Okay. There you go. Uh, let's go one back. Okay, we can move on then. So when, so just how common is this problem? It's funny, right? We don't get to hear about it enough, but I'm about to tell you it's actually more common than diabetes and vision problems, which we're all very comfortable seeking help for. About one in 12 US adults have problems with bowel incontinence. Uh, one in six US adults that is about 43 million U.S. adults have problems with bladder incontinence. And really, right, why do these things matter? Because loss of bladder or bladder, of bowel or bladder control lead to loss of sleep from waking up multiple times at night, waking up in the morning, feeling tired, exhausted. Patients tell me, I don't want to be around people because I think I smell because of either the urine leakage or the bowel leakage. So there's this general loss of sense of health. But keep in mind, look at the numbers I just went over. 43 million US adults have problems with urinary incontinence, 21 million with bowel incontinence. It's fairly common. It's more prevalent than diabetes and hypertension that we are all fairly comfortable seeking care for. And it really affects patients within a wide range of age but it's more common or more prevalent in the elderly or with advanced age. So the point here is do not feel like you're alone when it comes to problems with bowel issues or bladder issues. It is a medical problem. It is not part of normal aging.
So what we are going to talk about today is really the fact that as much as blood and bowel problems seem to take away your ability to enjoy the things you love to do, like spending time with family, going out to play cards, some patients are actually concerned about going back to work, which has been really interesting to hear about it with the end of the pandemic and the return back to office. I've had patients saying when I was home, working from home, I could rush to the bathroom, I could change my clothes. But now going into the office, I'm concerned, how am I going to handle this? And so the beauty of this presentation this evening is to let you all know, as much as this problem is a medical problem, there are great solutions for it if you're not too embarrassed to talk about it. About 44% of patients <clears throat> report that they're uncomfortable or embarrassed talking about bowel control issues or bladder control issues. 55, more than 50% of patients really never mention bladder control problems to their doctors even though they go in to see them. So the point here being, if you would speak up, there are really great solutions to get, to get you back to living the life you truly want to live. So what are some of the causes of bladder and bowel control issues? And these are some of the things where whenever you come into my office or to any um, practice that really takes care of patients or people with this problem, part of that initial visit is really listening to or getting a good history from you. And that includes your blood, your, um, your dietary habits. What is it you eat? What is it you drink? People that have diets that are high in carbonated beverages, acidic beverages, uh, caffeinated beverages tend to have more problems with bladder control. I see patients that they're like, I leak 24 seven, I can't do anything because I'm leaking, I'm wearing six, eight briefs uh, a day. And then when I ask them, but what do you drink? Oh, two to three uh, liters of Dr. Pepper a day. And generally, my response at that point is, if you would stop drinking Dr. Pepper, you may not need me. So part of that history, really looking at what your dietary habits are. Then I look at what are the medications or supplements you're taking. A lot of patients are on uh, diuretics that's designed to get rid of fluid or get rid of fluid from the body by making urine. The diuretic does the job of carrying the fluid from filtering the fluid from the kidney down into the bladder. If the bladder is working properly, it should be able to hold this fluid till you're ready. And so sometimes the diuretic is really not the problem. The bladder has an underlying problem and the diuretic is making it more prominent. And so sometimes we just have to change the time. If you normally take your diuretic at night, in the evenings, and then you're waking up all night, sometimes we'll work with your cardiologist or your primary care doctor so that you take that pill earlier in the day and so you can get some rest at night. And then there are things like pregnancy, childbirth, pelvic floor injury that will also contribute to the symptoms of bladder and bowel control. Next. Excuse me. So now let's talk about how should things work in the normal. I think it's really important to understand how things work because when you understand how things should work in the normal, it helps you understand and maybe make more informed choices when you choose which option when it comes to advanced therapies, when medications don't work or the dietary changes do not work. So normally, how should this work? The brain should send a signal to the bladder telling the bladder it's empty. So normally, urine, blood gets filtered by the kidneys. Urine comes down the ureter into the bladder. As the bladder is gradually filling up, it begins to stretch and expand. And as it's expanding, those nerves within the pelvis that are innervating or feeding the bladder begin to send a signal to your brain saying, my bladder is getting full. For most patients or for most of us, we can hold for one, sometimes up to two hours. And then when we are in a socially appropriate uh, location, then this, 
brain sends this signal back to the bladder saying it's time to urinate. And what happens? First, your pelvic floor relaxes, the bladder squeezes, and then you empty your bladder. And then when you're done, that feedback loop starts all over again. Same thing for same thing for bowel. So this brain bladder communication, an intact brain bladder communication is critical for proper bladder and bowel function. And so when we look at the therapies that address this problem, part of it's looking at solutions that can help in the proper functioning of this bladder bowel or bladder, of this brain bladder or brain um, bowel communication. Now, similar concept to brain bladder communication, we see, we see a similar communication pathway between the brain and the bowel. Normally, when you eat, food moves through the stomach, through the small and then the large intestines, and then by the time it gets to the rectum, as, and all of this movement of food and waste through the bowels is by a contraction of the bowel muscles with the bowel lining. By the time it gets to the rectum, as the rectum fills up, it stretches and this pelvic floor nerve sends a signal to the brain saying my bowels are getting full. And then you can now delay that until you get into a socially appropriate location and then the bowel the brain sends the signal to the bowel saying, I'm ready to evacuate, and you have a bowel movement. And so when, keep in mind, as I said before, when we look at therapy options for this bowel and bladder dysfunction, this brain um, communication pathway between the brain and the bowel or the brain and the bladder are critical. The miscommunication between the pathways can contribute to the bowel and bladder dysfunction we see. So what are the most common types of bladder control issues we see? Stress incontinence. Stress incontinence then meaning psychological stress, but this is really any increase in intra-abdominal pressure that transmits pressure into the onto the bladder. I cough, I sneeze, I laugh. A common one I hear is parents or grandparents tell me I can no longer play, jump on the trampoline with my grandkids or my kids because the moment I do that, I, can't, I leak. And some patients really completely empty their blood and not just leaking. Um, the second type we think of is what we call urinary retention. And in these patients, they tend to have more overflow in content. So they leak, not because the bladder is overactive, but because the bladder gets too full and it releases and it leaks randomly to release some of that pressure. And then the third one is overactive bladder, which, as we have noted before, generally the patient asks me, What is overactive bladder? I tell them normal voiding is less than eight times in the 24 hour period. So if you're voiding more than eight times in the 24 hour period, there is urgency. There may be leakage, there may not be. There's wet versus dry overactive bladder, as I like to describe it to my patients. So some people have frequency urgency. I'm going 20 times a day, but I generally can make it. And then there are patients that are going 10, 12 times a day, but they can never make it and they have accidents. So what is stress in common? As I mentioned earlier, it is Stress, not psychological stress, but intra-abdominal stress. That intra-abdominal stress meaning increase in, in, increase in pressure within the abdomen. That pressure gets transmitted to the bladder and it forces urine out. So patients will say, I cough, I sneeze, I laugh. A big one is I push up to get out of um, my car and I leak. And so how would some patients get around this? They'll say, I go to the bathroom every hour or two hours because I never want my bladder to get full. Because the moment my bladder gets full, I'm going to leak. And so they kind of self-manage in that uh, manner. 
and they'll tell you they really cannot predict. They cannot go walking with your friends. They cannot play pickleball. They cannot engage in any kind of strenuous activity because sometimes not only do they leak, it leaks through their path and completely soaks your clothes. Fresh unine content tends to be more related to pelvic floor weakness. So it's not a brain bladder communication as we've seen before, but this tends to be more related to weakness in the pelvic floor. And so childbirth tends to be a big predisposing factor. Uh, people that have jobs or activities that result in chronic high intra-abdominal pressure tend to see this more. Then the second type we talked about was urinary retention. And so these are the patients that they have a hard time telling you when their bladder is full. I have a lot of patients that come and see me and say, I don't think I'm emptying my bladder because I'm going to the bathroom every 30 minutes. But part of that walk up in my office is a bladder scan. And when I scan them, their bladder is completely empty. But because they have that urge to void all the time, they think they cannot empty. And then I have, which those patients do not have problems with urinary retention. They have a problem with overactive bladder. But in a patient with urinary retention, I'm sorry, they have a full bladder, but they can hardly tell their bladder is full. And then for the patients that can tell their bladder is full, some patients will tell me, I have to sit there and push on my abdomen. We call it credit maneuver to be able to void. And so they have a bladder that holds the urine, but doesn't have the ability to completely empty it out. And this could be related to a couple of reasons. Some patients have urinary retention, the inability to empty their bladder because they have an anatomic obstruction. So they have an enlarged prostate, they have a scar or what we call urethral stricture. So they have some scarring in their urethra and so the bladder cannot empty. So that is obstructive urinary retention because we can clearly identify some mechanism of blockage, be it an enlarged prostate or scarring in a urethra. This is different from patients that have what we call non-obstructive urinary retention, where they cannot empty their bladder, but there is no anatomic blockage. There is no enlarged process. There is no scar tissue. There is no mass that's preventing them from urinating. And for this patient, this particular group of patients with a non-obstructive urinary retention, targeting that path, that communication between the brain and the bladder would provide some relief for some of these patients. Next. Now, back to overactive bladder. When it comes to overactive bladder, I think earlier I mentioned wet versus dry overactive bladder. And this is really urgent content. I gotta go, I gotta go, I cannot hold it before I make it to the bathroom. It's running down my leg. Sometimes I'm completely emptying my bladder before I can make it there. Patients will tell me, I feel like I have this really strong urge to go, but when I go, I barely void anything. And then maybe an hour or two later, I go and I actually void. And what's happening is, that pathway that was supposed to let the bladder to completely fill up before the, you get that intense signal to go, it's disrupted for whatever reason. And so now you're having that constant urge to go, but there's barely anything in your bladder. And then sometimes you actually have a full bladder. I have patients that say, the moment you open the faucet, my bladder starts running. And so these patients are using pads Some people with resort to using grief um, and I had a patient that said I am buying diapers for my grandkids as well as myself and she was just very frustrated at this thought of at this point in her life instead of just truly having fun with her grandkids she was constantly having to buy uh, pull-ups she called them that she was buying for her toddler for her grandchild <clears throat> for party training but then the fact that it just couldn't get out and go, right? And then you have those patients that have urgency frequency. So they are going to the bathroom more than 
eight times in a 24 hour period, but most often they can make it there. But then they keep telling me, but I don't think I'm emptying my bladder because I just went to the bathroom. Right now, before I walked in through your office, I went to the bathroom and I'm sitting here and I need to go again. And when I scan your bladder, bladder scans are a good way of determining if the bladder is empty or not. And so in this patient, I'm like, well, I really don't think you're not emptying your bladder because when I scan your bladder, you're completely empty, but you have this constant urge to go. It's not urinary retention. It's not incomplete emptying. It's really overactive bladder. But part of my ability to distinguish these two problems from a retention versus an overactive bladder with constant urge that's emptying properly. It's really getting in, doing the proper history and physical exam and checking the bladder scan. And then I have patients that tell me I'm waking three, four times at night. And these patients tend to be really, it takes a big toll on their overall sense of well being. Uh, for some patients, it's almost to, leads to depression because. It's just like I stay home all day. I cannot, I do not have the energy to do anything because I spent all night going to the bathroom. Now, at the beginning of this um, talk, we did mention bowel incontinence or fecal incontinence. When it comes to fecal um, or bowel incontinence, there are two main groups. There are patients that say, I had no sensation I needed to use the bathroom for bowel movement. I go in and, or I smell something and I'm like, wait, what's going on? And I check my underwear and there's either a smear and then some patients will be like, I have pebble-like stools in my underwear or I just have a complete bowel movement. But they had absolutely no urge to go number two or to have a bowel movement. This is called passive fecal incontinence. Passive because there's really not a sensation or an urgency, and most often there is a lack of sensory awareness. When it comes to the urge fecal incontinence, very similar to the urge bladder incontinence, the patient says, I need to go number two and I need to go now. And so by the time they register, they need to have a bowel movement. It's already happening. And that goes back to that communication between the brain and the bowel. So for some of you, you may have, um, this may sound familiar, right? You're like, wait, wherever I have to go, I have to know where all the bathrooms are. When I walk into a restaurant, first I identify the bathrooms, where they're located, if I can, I pick a table closest to the bathroom because I'm concerned about having an accident. I would not, and it's not just an accident of bowel, but an accident of bladder as well. Um, this patient says sometimes I'm getting rid of, I have to throw out underwear because of stool staining my underwear. And so they are relying on protective pads. And most patients with bowel Incontinence tend to actually use more briefs or pull up or adult diapers just because they feel like it gives them a little bit more protection. And all of this are fairly costly for a lot of my patients, where cost becomes an important consideration in terms of using multiple four, five, six pull ups a day. So how do we get, and this is really the good part of this, right? We've spent a lot of time talking about the problem, um, identifying and defining this medical problem. But I think the most important part is we're not just identifying or talking about a problem. We're talking about a problem that has great options or great solutions. So generally, what is the first step? We generally would start conservatively. We would go over your diet, your um, the fluids you drink, um, the things you eat. Because some patients come in and say, I drink two gallons of water a day. Geez, if you drink two gallons of water a day, you gotta go to the bathroom. So in that case, I'll say, hey, let's get back to, let's get back on the water intake and see what happens to your bladder. 
if you tell me you're drinking two to three liters of Dr. Pepper, you drink two to three pots of coffee. I have patients, there's something about coffee and Dr. Pepper that I have patients that literally drink <laughs> coffee or Dr. Pepper all day. Those are things we can identify and with some changes in the behavior, we could actually give you the quality of life you want back. You could actually cut back on spending all that money on past grief. And so generally when I see patients with overactive bladder, bowel incontinence, urinary incontinence, I tend to say it a collaborative um, approach to management in the sense that there are things you're gonna have to do. Um, be really, you would have to be an active participant in your healthcare you're going to have to meet me halfway because there are things I can offer you. But if I identify some of these behaviors, then changing some of those behaviors take us, will take us both all the way. I always tell patients, it's a really stepwise, stepwise process. If the first intervention, yes, now I stop drinking coffee, I'm down to three cups a day from a pot of coffee, but I'm still leaking and I'm like, that's okay. It's a stepwise process. We have a treatment pathway. We move from the least conservative and then move up to advanced therapy as we need it. And so after lifestyle changes, I move on to oral medications. We have two big classes of oral medications. We tend to talk about the side effects of all of those medications. And then after that, we move to the advanced therapies which here we see some really unique and um, interesting options with really high efficacy that really address some of these underlying issues of communication between the brain and the bladder, brain and the bowel. So lifestyle changes, right? For a lot of patients with stress incontinence, I'll talk about capable exercises. I'll talk about exercise. So we do a combination of exercise and pelvic force training, training because Kegel stress and incontinence tends to be more of a problem of pelvic floor weakness. Sometimes losing weight would make, um, would help with that. Some patients with, I gotta go, I gotta go, I cannot hold it. We will talk about time voiding. Um, if you have this urge stopping squeezing and relaxing the pelvic floor rapidly, and then keep going with your activity and see if you can hold it. And I always tell you, try these things in areas, where, especially when you're at home, right? I don't want you trying these things at Walgreens or at Walmart or at the grocery store and then having an accident that just doesn't go well. Uh, diet, eliminating those um, bladder irritants um, in your diet. <clears throat> So now the next, um, we've done dietary modification, lifestyle changes. Now we move on to medication. This, um, I would really talk about it in two big categories. There are two main groups of medications for overactive bladder. There's one group we call beta-3 agonists. The side effects we could see, there would be things like hypertension, nasal congestion, headaches, and then the medications that have been around forever, a group called anticholinergic. A lot of patients have heard of Ditropan, Detrol, Tolbiaz. And the side effects of this particular group tends to be dry eyes, dry mouth, constipation. In patients that have uh, glaucoma, this is contraindicated. So I generally would ask about glaucoma when I see patients when we're thinking about starting them on medical therapy. And then a big part of my history is gathering a history in terms of um, any history of dementia, any issues with memory loss in the patient. Because when it comes to the anti cholinergic, there's an increasing body of evidence associating the use of anti cholinergic with decline in cognitive function and memory loss. And so when I see my advanced age patients, and even in younger patients that may have this concern or have a significant history of um, dementia in the family, I tend to be more cautious and it becomes really a conversation of this is the risk um, profile of this medication. Is it something you would be comfortable taking? 
But I think what's unique about medications is 72% of patients stop taking their overactive bladder medications within six months. And I think a huge part of this that I've observed in my practice is the side effect profile. And a lot of these patients are on other medications that compound the side effects and make them a lot worse. So talking more about um, overactive bladder patients, and I think why this particular slide is important is to really illustrate the importance of what I would call a treatment pathway. Your first, when it comes to bowel and blood incontinence, it's really important that you understand that your first visit is not your last visit. It is a stepwise process, and so do not get discouraged and not follow up, right? Only 20% of patients with overactive bladder say they're extremely satisfied with their current treatment. And the number one current treatment is medication. 82% of overactive bladder patients are not adherent to medications for 12 months. So think about it. You give a pill to a patient that would help them with frequency, urgency of urination, cut back on how many packs they are using. It allows, hopefully, we're hoping it allows them to get back to the activities of daily living. But about 82% of those patients do not adhere to their medication. It tells us a few things. The side effects are probably not great, and it's not as efficacious, or it's not helping their symptoms as well as they had hoped. And because these patients don't do great after that first visit, 60% of them do not return after their initial appointment. And then those that make it back 80% after the second appointment, and by the third appointment, if your bladder is not perfect, most of them do not come back. And so I hope if you ever get to see me or any urologist in managing uh, either bladder and bowel dysfunction, it is a chronic medical problem like diabetes, like hypertension. It requires subsequent care. Sometimes it requires more than one or two therapies to get the perfect therapy for you. There is not one size fit all solution. There's not one size fits all solution for this problem. But if you would consistently, I encourage my patients to communicate with me. Tell me what you don't like about this therapy, what you like about the therapy. And that patient, I walk into my office and say, I've never taken medications. I'm terrible at taking medications. Please do not bring me go through medicine. And when a patient communicates with me that clearly, it helps me tailor their treatment plans to the options that I know they would actually adhere with and it would help address their symptoms. So after we've done conservative management medications, if we're still not happy with the kind of control we're getting, then we talk about advanced therapy. There's three big ones. There's the Medtronic Innocent System, um, and this system really relies on optimizing that brain bladder and brain bowel communication. There's the metronic neuro system, which here, instead of stimulating the nerve through um, the sacrum, you're doing it through the tibial nerve and then that injectable medication that we can also use to help address this overactive bladder issue. When it comes to bowel control, we have the very system that controls your bladder can be helped to manage bowel. And this is one of those really unique <coughs> options here because a lot of patients I see for bladder also have bowel issues. Most of them, if they talk about bladder, when it comes to the bowel, I have to probe a little more because it's very embarrassing and makes patients feel very self-conscious. But I want you to understand that there are therapies that could actually address both of bladder overactivity, frequency urgency, urge incontinence, as well as urge bowel incontinence simultaneously, not two different procedures, but you rather using one therapy to address 
support of this issue. So when it comes to the advanced therapies, let's talk about Botox. Many of you have heard of Botox, some of you maybe not, but it's most commonly used in cosmetic applications, right? People use it for wrinkles, people use it for migraines, people use it for contractions. But what we are doing with Botox is we are injecting it into the muscle of the bladder to partially paralyze or relax that bladder muscle to help the bladder hold greater volume hold longer before you can, before you void. When it comes to Botox, the effectiveness of Botox is comparable to bladder medications like the anticholinergic for the better three agonists we have talked about. Um, this particular therapy does not address that brain bladder dysfunction we see, that we know is the underlying cause of this bladder and bowel dysfunction problem. When I talk to patients about Botox, one of the most important considerations, we look at the side effect profile, about 6% uh, and sometimes higher depending on which data you look at. Patients, when you give them Botox, they do not void. So they develop urinary retention. These patients have the urge to void, but that bladder muscle will not contract to let them void. So if I'm going to give you Botox, my general rule is, if you happen to fall in that small number of patients that have retention, you have to be willing to cast yourself or wear a catheter. If you're unwilling to cast yourself or wear a catheter, then I generally tell you Botox is not an option for you. So other than urinary retention, the other potential side effect of Botox is urinary tract infections. And so most often we would pre-treat you with antibiotics. But as you can see, this particular option targets that end organ, which is the bladder, and not necessarily that communication between the brain and the bladder. And this can be used to address primarily bladder. And so when I see patients that have both that urge fecal incontinence and bladder incontinence, this tends not to be the number one option, but definitely you would get presented with it, and then you would see the rationale why I would opt for something else. <clears throat> if you presented with that combination of bowel and bladder issues. And then the next one is percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation. This is a safe, really minimally invasive option, generally done in the office. This is also uh, targeting um, nerve stimulation, but you instead of stimulating this pelvic nerve, you're stimulating a branch of that nerve that goes down the leg called the tibial nerve. So I generally describe this to patients as having an acupuncture needle placed. You get, um, we place the that needle as you can see on the image. You get stimulated in the office for 30 minutes and then you go home. And so for patients that really none of those other options are viable to them, this is a great safe, efficacious option. Is it as efficacious as some of the other options? Maybe not, but it is a great option for patients that are looking for really minimal invasive therapy. And if it doesn't work, keep in mind, you can always try any of the other therapies. So generally it's once a week for 12 weeks. And if you have a great response, then I'll generally have you come back monthly for amendment sessions. And depending on how you do, sometimes we can push some of those amendments um, into our out to two months or three months, depending on your response. And then option number three, this is what we will call a sacral nerve modulation. So whenever I talk about S and M, that's sacral nerve modulation. And here we're referring to the Medtronic Innocence system. And so now let's think back for a second to how we had talked about normal bladder function requiring intact communication between the brain and the bladder to function effectively. This therapy primarily targets that pathway. It seeks to optimize that brain bladder or brain bowel communication 
to allow for optimal bowel and bladder control. And how does it do this? It does, it does this by gently stimulating those pelvic nerves that innervate the bladder so that appropriate signals are sent into uh, the brain and then the bladder responds appropriately. A good way of describing this, or a good analogy for this is, think about being in a really noisy, crowded restaurant, right? And you're trying to have a conversation with your dinner partner. With all the noise going around, you can barely hear it. But now, if you had everybody quiet and the room go silent, then you can effectively communicate with your partner. And so when we think of sacral nerve modulation, the Medtronic Innocent System, SNM, what we are, the goal of this therapy or the mechanism of action of this therapy is seeking to quiet that background noise from the pelvic floor to allow for more effective communication between the brain and the bladder and thereby controlling or providing better bladder and bowel control. This is the only option of all those therapies that we discussed that really seeks to optimize the pathway between brain and bladder. So really looking to work along the natural function or the natural pathways of the bladder and bowel communicating with the brain to allow for better bladder and bowel control. Normally with this therapy, I generally tell my patients what another unique aspect of this therapy is the fact that we can test you in the office. So about 90 to 95% of my patients that have that we determine that this is the best therapy for them, we initiate a testing in the office. Without any anesthesia, you come in, we clean right um, the lower portion of the sacrum, we put a test stimulator underneath your skin, you take it home for three days, and you either say my bladder got a lot better or it didn't. And remember, even during that testing phase, we can make adjustments to that stimulation to those pelvic floor nerves. And so, sacral nerve modulation, uh, SNM with the Medtronic Innocent system, has been used to treat over to treat hundreds of thousands of patients. It is an effective and a longer term bladder management option, as well as for bowel. When we talked about things like Botox, keep in mind you had to come in every three to six months because just as Botox that's used for cosmetic reasons for the face or for migraines wears of over three to six months, same thing with Botox when we use it for the bladder. You have to come in every three to six months. When this therapy is determined to be the optimal therapy for you, it is long-term in the sense that it's good for 10 years and sometimes longer, depending on which option you choose, because we have a rechargeable with a battery life of up to 15 years and a non-rechargeable with a battery life of uh, up to 10 years. And so this is really a great option. Um, over 80% of patients report great management of symptoms even after five years of implants. So it's a long-term, durable, efficacious way of managing the bladder by really taking advantage of that now normal bladder brain or bladder bowel communication pathways. For some patients that may have been familiar with um, sacral nerve modulation or the Medtronic innocence system, I think the great news that has, or the great innovation that has happened over the years is now we can get an MRI on the patient with this device implanted. I think I've seen an influx of patients that have come to me because they need an MRI for whatever reason. They're like, my bladder stimulator was great, but it was placed five, six years ago before we had the option for the MRI. And so now I have to get rid of my bladder, my device which controls my bladder to be able to get an MRI. And now I can confident, confidently tell this patient, actually, we would just switch it out. And that has been really amazing for a lot of patients knowing that they can get their required MRI imaging 
with this device in place. So on this device, you have an MRI mode and you would simply switch to that MRI mode during your uh, testing. <clears throat> so is this therapy right for you in terms of is InnoStem right for you? And I generally tell my patients, um, there's not one therapy that works for everybody. It really starts with getting a proper history and physical. We take into account your, co your personal competing medical conditions. We talk about what's important in terms of outcomes. Are you looking for the most least invasive option? Are you looking for the option with the longest durability and best efficacy? And so we take all of this into account when we choose which therapy is best for you. And as I said before, it's really a collaborative effort. I may have an opinion about what I do, but this is the best therapy based on the data and how much and my um, experience as a physician and as a urologist. But it's really important that I take the things that are important to you into consideration as we choose um, your therapy option. So if you have, um, so this is the medical problem that can be addressed just like the effort, diabetes, and hypertension. We can find the data in the diet using uh, anticholinergic or overactive data medication. And then this treatment to not give you the path. Can you all hear me okay? I was just going to in say, Dr. Kajanji, the last couple of sentences were a little garbled. Um, now okay. I can have, maybe just repeat the last couple of sentences. If, if you can. Okay, so we were maybe talking about is the yeah. therapy. Are we better now? Much better. Okay, great. And please, if at any point I am, you all cannot hear me, please let me know. Um, so we are really at the end of this presentation. I was really trying to determine or answer the question, is this the right therapy for me? The Medtronic bladder Innocent system for bladder and bowel control, is this the right therapy for me? If you have significant symptoms that are bothersome, and when I say they're bothersome, I'm missing going out to my daughter's graduation or I'm dreading going, driving two or three hours to a family reunion because I have to stop at every uh, gas station for the bathroom. I'm worried about having accidents and packing packs and changes of clothes. If you have symptoms that are really interfering with your ability to fully live and enjoy um, your time and your life, then we think about lifestyle modifications in terms of getting rid of those bladder irritants. We look at oral medications, be it anticholinergic or beta-3 agonists. We take into account the risk profile of each of these medications. We take into account cost and choose whichever one is best for you. And then if your symptoms are still not relieved, then we talk about advanced therapies, right? Based on my experience and the data on the different treatment options when it comes to advanced therapy, I may feel strongly about one therapy or the other. But it's really important that I take into account what your preference is, your lifestyle choices, what's important to you in arriving at which advanced therapy is the best for you. But all of this starts with you actually seeking care. So when it comes to the NSM or the metronic therapy, what kind of long-term outcomes have we seen? Over 84% of patients that have used this for bladder control are doing great five, six years down the road. There's a greater improvement in quality of life. So I can spend more time doing the things I like to do compared to medication. And then patients, and I think this is the real unique success rate 
right, or something that's very unique and beautiful about the therapy. Bowel incontinence can be incredibly isolating and depressing. And when there's a therapy option that can give you an 89% long-term success rate and staying eight years or longer, that is truly amazing because it really keeps these patients their life back. With all of these therapies, right, there are potential side effects. We would think about things like changes in, and those side effects we would discuss, right, when we, um, the potential side effects taking into account your personal medical problems. And so I hope this um, time we spent has been informative and hopefully would allow some of you to actually seek the care you need to allow you to fully fit in your life. We have a few patient testimonial videos. We'll see if this would actually play right, okay? And so if you all cannot hear us, just give us feedback and we will um, stop the video. I don't think we can, we tried playing the video, Dr. Kachanji, what did you want me to try? Let's try. Let's try the bow video and just, okay. if you all would please just give us some yeah. feedback if you can hear us or not, or if you can hear the video. Boys, Drew and Josh. My story began actually the night before Drew was born. I ended up with food poisoning. I was very sick, and then the next morning, I was born. The video is breaking up for me. It's kind of jumbled. That's what I was afraid of it. Um, we'll try. Well, I nobody's saying they can't hear it, but I was afraid it might be a little jumbled from earlier. We'll try for tw ten more seconds. Then I started having contractions, but Joe got stuck actually. We were both in the hospital. See what kind of feedback I'm getting. Difficult to understand. I would say if it's difficult, we should probably just move to the end and the questions and answers. Okay. Is that okay with you, Dr. Kachanji? Yes, it is. Okay. Let's just move to here and um, where I can say to the audience here, of course, thank you so much for being with us tonight and we will we can open it up to Dr. Kachanji's ability to answer questions. Um, as you can tell, she's an expert in this and um, we're happy to try to have her answer any of your questions. Also, what I will do is I will launch a second poll, which can be super helpful to all of us. Um, and then there is some information here also on this slide as to how you can reach Dr. Kachanji if you'd like to make an appointment. So I will read the questions that are in the Q&A, continue to ask them as well. And let's see what the first one is that we have. Um, we have a question, Dr. Kachanji, what can I do to strengthen my bladder? Well, I'm going to rephrase that question a little bit. Um, I think it's really what can you do to strengthen your pelvic floor? Um, because the pelvic floor muscles are what provides support um, for the bladder and the urethra. So you can do exercises, kegels exercises for pelvic floor strengthening. But then it really depends on why do you need to strengthen your pelvic floor? What is the problem you're trying to address? Because when patients come to me with pelvic pain or with overactive bladder, then I tend to recommend more pelvic floor relaxation and biofeedback as opposed to a patient who comes to me with stress incontinence, I tend to recommend more pelvic floor strengthening with Kegels. So I think it's really important to distinguish why you think why why you think you need pelvic floor strengthening 
and then that would really, but ultimately if pelvic floor strengthening is what you need, it's Kegels exercises or pelvic floor exercises. And we can always get you a pelvic floor physical therapist. That's a physical therapist that specializes with the pel in pelvic floor um, issues to help you. Okay. Uh, somebody asks, I had a slight problem before a recent surgery. However, since the surgery, when I stand to go to the restroom, my bladder completely releases and I have no control. I desperately try to hold my urine, but to no avail. So I guess they're wondering what you might have to say about that. So patients have underlying bladder dysfunction, right? Urinary incontinence, but they have developed ways to manage it, be it through tightening their pelvic floor before they cough or they sneeze or crossing their legs, um, being really slow to move, and paying attention or just doing what we call time voiding, going to the bathroom every hour. And it's always interesting because after surgery, some patients say, well, I really didn't have this problem or I had a little bit of it and it really got bad after surgery. And sometimes under anesthesia, some of those compensatory mechanisms that you as the patient and the bladder and your body have adopted to help cope with this problem get actually kind of taken away and then now you truly see the full picture of what's going on and then anesthesia sometimes would paralyze the bladder right and then depending on what surgery you had sometimes movement becomes you cannot get to the bathroom as fast and so it seems like your problem is worse but after surgery your mobility or your ability to just dash into the bathroom is limited what you're describing sounds like stress incontinence I think I would recommend you let things settle down for um, a few weeks, but then get in and get properly evaluated. Another question we have is, can you do the tibial nerve stimulation with a TENS unit? What you, with a TENS unit? No, really, um, it has to be an approved device for uh, tibial nerve stimulation with the appropriate needle and the appropriate settings. So that would be an off-label use. I cannot speak to that. I don't think that device is FDA, a tenth unit is not FDA approved for neuromodulation. So I would say that. Okay. Somebody is saying I'm on five milligrams of oxybutynin. What is the range of dosage typically used for control and how long can one be on it? Um, oxybutynin is one of those medications that fall in the class of anticholinergic. Generally, you want to start at the lowest dose that provides relief. For non-neurogenic bladder patients, the maximum dose tends to be 10 milligrams. But keep in mind, as we go higher in dose, you may notice a slight improvement in efficacy, but then those side effects begin to really become more pronounced in terms of dry eyes, dry mouth, constipation, and then that mental fogginess, and then that concern for what is the impact on cognitive function. And so ideally, we want to use the lowest dose. I'll generally start patients on five milligrams daily. And if they really don't see significant improvement, my recommendation tends to be moving on instead of going to higher doses because those side effects begin to come down. Okay, another question is, does insurance cover this? Yes, all of the therapies mentioned in both are covered by insurance. And generally, we would get the insurance pre-approval before we proceed once you've been appropriately evaluated and deemed a candidate for one of these therapies. Okay. Does this treatment involve using pressure points? No. Okay. It, and I'm not exactly sure what treatment, but I'm assuming she was referring to sacral nerve modulation. It's really placed at specifically designed locations based on the location of those pelvic floor nerves. That's the S3 for a man that supply the bladder. Is the inner stem compatible with a pacemaker? Yes, it is. It's, it's funny because Medtronic is really known for 
um, a cardiac pacemaker. That's what they've been known for. So yes, I do have patients that have a pacemaker for their heart and a pacemaker for their bladder. This one, I will call it sometimes. Yeah. Can you speak more about physical therapy and pelvic strengthening for urinary urgency frequency? So when it comes to urinary urgency frequency, most of those patients tend to need biofeedback. And some of those patients tend to have more hypertonicity, so increased pelvic floor tone. So in those patients, when I refer them to physical therapy, it's for biofeedback, but it's really for pelvic floor relaxation. Pelvic floor strengthening tends to be more useful for patients with stress incontinence. Keep in mind, active bladder frequency urgency is really related to that miscommunication between the brain and the bladder or the brain and the bowel for patients with fecal incontinence. And so in those patients, pelvic floor strengthening does not tend to address the problem. Okay. Um, let's see if I have any. Okay, I have another one. What do you do if you have urinary urgency only when you have to go to the bathroom and get close to a bathroom? In other words, the person says they're fine until they get close to the bathroom, and then it seems hard to hold. That's where sometimes biofeedback would prove useful, right? Uh, bladder training. I'm tell you, like, quickly, squeeze, relax, squeeze, relax pelvic floor flip, your pelvic floor, and then hold it, let that urge subside and see if you can delay voiding for an hour, two hours. But for some patients, that is truly overactive bladder. And so that's why we tend to start conservatively and then to offer more advanced therapies if we do not respond to conservative therapy. What do most of your patients say to you after they receive the interstim therapy? I, that's a very interesting question. I think um, when I really got into pelvic floor, it was really seeing how the small 30-minute outpatient procedures and you hear a patient walk in through the door and say, you've totally changed my life. It truly gives them when you select the right patients for this therapy, it truly gives them their life back. And so that's what I'm, I can teach a lot of my patients. That is great. I'm looking, I don't see any other more, any questions. Additionally, I have a lot of thank yous um, for you, Dr. Kachanji. A lot of people appreciated everything you shared with them tonight. And for those of you who are still with us, there is a survey. The minute you end the webinar, there is one last quick survey. If you wouldn't mind um, giving us your thoughts, we'd appreciate it. And then is there anything else that you'd like to say before we conclude, Dr. Kajanji? Well, I would like to say, Kelly, thank you for really putting this together. Thank you to each of you who tuned in. Hopefully, this information not only helps you and may not apply to you, but this education does allow you to maybe inform a family member, a friend. But I really hope you got out of here today. If you have any bladder problems or bowel problems, realizing that it is a medical condition, you should not be ashamed for it or embarrassed about it. It is not normal part of aging. And if you would really speak up and seek care, there are really wonderful options that could really give you your life back. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Kajanji. You are such an expert at this and you're so caring and helpful. And again, we appreciate everybody who joined us tonight. So thank you all. Have a lovely evening the rest of you for, for, for the rest of the night. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Bye. Bye.